Welcome to the She Plays On Women's Football Podcast. I'm your host Harry Chan. This week, I talk with former Lewis player Jess King about her experience playing abroad in five countries, not fearing failure, as well as some encouraging pre-match rituals. I have to put everything on the left before the right, so. I could like my sock or my shin pad or my boots, and if I don't, then I have to take it off and start again.、Um, and it is a bit weird, but I think you know that is something that I have to do. Otherwise, I just don't feel right. Your your pre match ritual about putting things on the left first. There's another、um, male football player who does it and who also plays as striker. That's Harry Kane. So that's probably something that's good. But first, some news from this week. Champions Chelsea face an away game at Manchester United in the opening 2022-21 WSL fixture. Aston Villa, who won promotion from the Championship last season, starts at home to Manchester City. While Arsenal begins with a home game against Reading, dropping down to second tier level are former WSL champions Liverpool, who will start the 2022-21 campaign with a home game against Durham. The first round of matches will take place on the 5th to 6th of September, and only the first two rounds of fixtures have been confirmed, with a full schedule set to be released in early September. Games will take place behind closed doors until it is safe for supporters to return, with matches not chosen for broadcast on live television being streamed on the FA Player app. The remaining fixtures are as follows: in the WSL, Brighton and Hove Albion will face Birmingham City, Bristol City will face Everton, Tottenham Hotspur will face West Ham United in a London derby, and in the Championship. Charlton Athletic will face Crystal Palace, Coventry United against London Bees, Leicester City against Blackburn Rovers, London City Lionesses against Sheffield United, and since there are eleven clubs in the Championship, Lewis will start the season with a free week. In France, Lyon wins their ninth French Cup as they beat PSG four three on penalties. With the score nil nil after normal time, a crowd of five thousand people watched the game in Auxerre due to COVID nineteen restrictions. European champions Lyon were crowned French champions in May after the league was cancelled due to the coronavirus pandemic. You are going to love our next guest if you like good music. She is a former Lewis player and wrote her own rap song "Raise Us Up." Please welcome the athletically and musically talented Jess King. Well, let's get started then.、Um, so, I want to start off with your playing career in general, because you played in a lot of countries, not just in, in Europe. You also played in Canada. You you were a student at. Uh, the Canada Trinity Western University. Can you tell us what you were studying there, and did you go there with a scholarship or something? Yeah, yeah, I went there when I was eighteen with a scholarship,、um, and I was there for four and a half years、um, playing out there. So, yeah, that that's kind of where my traveling first started. This is a different pathway compared to. Have some players going through the academy or, or or going to the states, the USA, for example. Why why did you choose Canada as as your 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 first step, perhaps? Well, I actually had a a, a visa to live there because my mum had actually wanted to move there a few years earlier, so that was helpful because I was able to stay there, you know, during the summertime and get a job. Um. But also because they were the best team in Canada at the time, and、um, I didn't have to take the SATs like I, I did for the US. So、um, 
yeah, there was a, a few, it was a bit more complicated with the US schools and the, the one that I had my heart set on um, fell through through complications of something that was out of my control. Um, and then Trinity became an option and then I, I decided that that was the place that I was going to pursue. Right, I see. So, now of course, the states you said you also thought of the USA, but how about the United Kingdom? Do did, did you like think of staying here like locally and, and instead of going to Canada? Well, I'd always kind of have my heart set on, on going either to the US or, you know, then when Canada became an option to go there because um, I knew that the setup would be very different to what I was experiencing in football at the time in England in terms of facilities, you know, playing football every day, um, just having access to a lot more um, in, in football and in, in the academic realm as well. Um, so I think that's kind of why I had my um, eyes set on that. Right, I see. Now, if other younger players who are also, let's say, 18 years old or around that age, ask you whether you would recommend them to go through this path to, uh, by going to Canada or, or the USA, would you recommend this path? You know what, I think it, it depends on, on each person and 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 what the individual wants. But I think there's so many positive things that come from going there um, and things that teach you about life. And it the, the, the game, they're very different and it challenges you in a different way. And I think I definitely grew a lot and learned a lot very quickly by moving there. So I'll definitely recommend it. And it's it's probably one of the highlights of, of, of my career and of my life, I really, um, loved my time there and and um, always look back on it as, as a very fond memory. I see. So now I also know that you are a Liverpool supporter and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you were even younger, back in 2009, you played for Liverpool and, and you were actually the top scorer in the league. Is that, is that accurate? <laughs> Um, I was not the top scorer in the league, but I did play for Liverpool for right. 10 years. Um, and yeah, I really loved that as well. Because um, that's, you know, I've always supported Liverpool and um, it was it was something that I really cherished and valued as representing the team that I support. But obviously, I had to kind of leave that behind to pursue what else I wanted to. And yeah, it was... It was um, definitely a big positive for me as a kid. I see. Well, I mean, it was Wikipedia who told us that you were the top scorer, so... Um. <laughs> yeah, there's a few things that I've seen on there that, that are not accurate, so it's okay, but I actually played as a as a fullback a lot of the time. Right. Um, so it prevented me from scoring as many goals as, as I would have liked. After Canada, you played in a total of let's say five countries you played in switzerland germany norway canada and then now in england um what are, are the biggest takeaways from you know being in all these countries and playing in different leagues yeah i mean you know if i get asked this question a lot and there's not one thing that i would probably say that i love the most or dislike the most because every place gave me something different and also had different challenges. Um, but I think, you know, you have to put yourself out there. And um, when you go to a new country, when you can't speak the language, you know, you have to integrate somehow, even if you can't communicate literally with the same language. Um, yeah, you know, obviously, especially going to Germany, all, the, all of the countries really, I had to adjust. Um, my game, you know, playing in the Bundesliga, there's, you know, you don't get much time on the ball and I had to adjust quickly because, you know, you, you just get thrown in and you expect it to perform. And yeah, I think it, it's, a, it's a challenge for sure, but I definitely, um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Right. Um, you, you said a bit about language. Is it true that football 
serves as a common language, or is it not exactly accurate? I think to some extent, yes, because, you know, there was a couple of girls on my team in Switzerland. I was learning German and they couldn't speak English really at all. And my coach couldn't speak English, but we could always communicate. Um, you know, we always had jokes together and stuff, but it was just in a very different way than I was ever used to. Or I'm sure they were ever used to um, when you can speak the same language as somebody. And I think it does bring people together. Um, but I'd probably say the only thing that's difficult is in the match and people were giving me instructions in German. It would take me a little bit longer to kind of, you know, react to that as opposed to when somebody would say it in English. Um, yeah. Yeah, I see. Um, right. You use, you talked a bit about um, playing in different leagues and the fact that leagues are different. Like in the Bundesliga, you don't get a lot of the ball. Um, what is, or if there's any, like, biggest difference between the style of play or maybe even the coaching? You know, are there some differences that, was, that, that were very clear to you when you went from one league to another? Um, well, I mean, in Canada, in North America, it's very fast. You know, a lot of the players, the athletes, you know, strong, fast. Everything is like 100 mile an hour, you know. And if you're not going 100 mile an hour, then you're going to get run over kind of thing. Um, I think when when I came back and played at Everton just after, um, after university, I think that um, I was definitely challenged technically. Um, more so than physically because there was a different um, there was a different style of play or expectation um, and I think also as I went on to each league you know with the better players that I played with I learned learned a lot from them technically um, and tactically tactical things was massive in Germany um, so yeah it, it, it yeah the adjustments interesting but you know it's just part of part of the process right speaking of the leagues in 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 england you know you played of course for uh, uh lewis for 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 a couple uh, a couple of years um and in the championship now we have part-time contracts of course it's a topic that we often bring up in different discussions but as a player who actually have have like you have first-hand experience of you know playing under part-time contracts do you think there's anything that can be or should be changed to the system i don't think there's one clear answer for that i mean mm -hmm. the obvious thing is money mm -hmm. money then filters down into the more training hours more physio more weight training more time to spend talking about football watching the game you know, all of the things that matter that contribute to being 100% a full-time athlete um, that I've struggled with the adjustment. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I think on obviously, like from my perspective, until money's put into it, mm. it's not really going to change. You know what I mean? Like you can see yeah. some clubs getting more money and then able to go full-time and then their teams are getting better. So it's not, it's not that difficult to do, but it's being made very difficult to do by the people with money or the people making the decisions. Um, right. So I think, yeah, there's not one smooth answer and I think everyone's going to have a different angle or a different perspective on that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think as soon as money, more money is put into it, then different steps can be made to, to kind of bridge the gap of the championship and the WSL. Right, I see. Now, you, you mentioned this earlier. You, you were talking about, you know, uh, England as, you know, perhaps a, a, as a national team gaining more traction. But there, there are a lot of differences between uh, the league or in general women's football in the past and now. Uh, what would the biggest difference for you when you look at the time when you first started out as uh, a, a younger player at 17 or maybe 18 compared to uh, the system or the environment now? 
Well, I think, yeah, I think a lot has changed. Um, you know, you see full-time people, like people getting paid when I was a kid, that didn't happen. Um, you know, training more than twice a week, even in the championship, you know, you train more than twice a week, most most teams anyway, as far as I'm aware. Um, I think people's attitudes, like the players, you know, you take things more seriously, like nutrition, um, how you look after your body, the recovery. Um, yeah, I think I think there's a lot a lot that's changed, and I think athletically you can see players more and more fit, more strong, um, which makes the game better, which makes it faster. Um, yeah, and I think it's it is cool to see that, and I think it will continue to to grow the more full time opportunities that there are. I see. Now you are also doing work to help uh, younger. Uh, players as an ambassador for uh, Kickoff at Free, which is like an organization that, uh, amongst other things, promote equality uh, uh, in, in, in the football or the sports sector. Can you tell us more about what they do and perhaps what you do as an ambassador? Yeah, so I think they really want to get more, more girls involved in their football tournaments and stuff. Um, and I think they're really just wanting to bring a positive energy positive vibe into football into the community um, and you know kind of bridge the gap a little bit between the police um, and the community you know obviously especially in the last few months we've seen that affected and I think you know football is a good way to bring everyone together you know what I mean and, and I really enjoy that and they they give opportunities for people to play football from from all backgrounds and you know, they help raise money for different charities and organisations. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really awesome what they're doing and, you know, helping young people understand and want to give back to the community, I think is, is, is really um, something that is overlooked and, and not really something that we value, so to speak, as a whole community or a whole society. Um, so it's really been nice to... Kind of be a part of that but obviously with lockdown and everything we haven't really been able to get hands-on involved and um, so i'm looking forward to to when they can put on their first like football tournament so that hopefully depending on on football schedule and everything to kind of get hands-on and go and meet the other people involved so yeah it's been it's been a really exciting thing that i've been able to be a part of i see yeah no. Um, all right. So, uh, other than that, one thing we have yeah. to talk about uh, your song, um, the, your yeah. rap song. It's co-written with uh, Max uh, Mesowave called "Raise Yourself." Yeah. Now, um, I want to start with the background, though, because you say that in, in other interviews, you say that the background is about iconic moments in the men's game, while women's football was banned, you know, in in the nineteen hundreds or late nineties, if I remember correctly. Um, what events are we looking at in particular and what they mean for you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just recognising that women's football was banned and during those 50 years, you know, the men's game significantly progressed. You know, women's football was selling out stadiums, you know, um, on I think it was... Christmas Day or Boxing Day in Goodson Park, it was full for the women's for a women's match, and I think um, I just wanted to recognise all of that, what's gone on, but then also kind of what people have been through to get where we are today. You know, there's been a lot of people before us that have had to sacrifice a lot for the game to be at the place where it is today, and I think also wanted to connect people you know because even though the game's professional and everything there's still little things that that you experience that's very disrespectful or you know even things like not every team will have access to having women's kit you know imagine sending women's kit to a man's team and saying oh sorry you know and it just it it's uncomfortable you know just little things like that and I think that's kind of where it came from um and after reading the background about it, I thought, do you know what? I think 
people would be willing to listen because of how much things have changed in England. Right, I see. Um, so another thing is you mentioned quite a number of uh, a few women football stars who in the song. So we have like Alex Scott, we have Kelly Smith, Mia Hamm, Rachel Yankee, and then Michelle Akers. So what do these players mean to you, perhaps especially when you were starting off as a player yourself? Yeah, I think, you know, Michelle Akers and Mia Hamm were, were my first, sorry, um, <laughs> they were my first female role models because the US football was more, um, you know, advertised than English football was. You know, I spent some time there and I think, you know, I read their books and everything and then Rachel Yankee, Alex Scott, Kelly Smith, they were the players that, you know, I really rated and, you know, I would watch when whenever I got the chance if they were on the TV or I could go to a, a game or whatever. Um, and now I think, you know, having social media gives so much more access for kids to, to see the their role models and I think that's cool. Yep. Um, now I want to talk about if one one or two messages that uh, uh, was delivered perhaps from the song. Now one of the things uh, you also mentioned it some time earlier is that there's a lack of access to, you know, just in general facilities for recovery such as physios or in general sports science facilities. So as a player yourself, what was your experience uh, in, 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 in these fields, perhaps? Yeah, I think just... Um, yeah, I mean, the, there's, there's still a lack of facilities and, you know, so, some, some clubs of, you know, especially, you know, if they're connected to a big men's club, um, they have access to, you know, the same things that the men do, but then there's still, you know, a lack of physio or, you know, if you get injured, then some teams will just leave you be. You know, if you need an operation, then you kind of on your own. Some clubs will obviously take care of you. Um, and I think it is getting better, but I think, you know, especially with that side of things with people's health and recovery, I think it should be something that's implemented. And I think that, you know, the FA have made, started to make um, provisions for, for that so, so you know, people can actually physically play or, you know. Um, but things like having the lights turned off when it was training at night, once it hit nine o'clock or not being allowed into buildings, you have to sit in a in a cabin instead of going into a building because the men's or the boys, the under tens are in there. You know, and it's it I think that says a lot really. Um but in saying that I think it is changing and I think it will continue to do so. And I think for me I just wanted to keep to to use the song to to keep the conversation going because you can't ignore the change that's happened because it's a positive thing, but, you know, we have to still keep talking about it and wanting more so that it does continue to develop. Right, I see. Um, that's, that's of course, very, very accurate, you know, that, that we're changing and we're trying to still... There, there are a lot of improvements to be done. And one thing you said that I think is, is very... Um, I have to say it's very amazing. It's that you said the song, it's not anger that you're expressing but rather it's a, a unique angle of um, getting a push for more respect and equality for women's football um, which I think is very very well put um, in, in, at least in my opinion. Now how do you want people who are listening to the song to understand the message or understand the song? I think for the players I want I want them to kind of feel motivated and feel connected to each other you know like I say you're never going to keep us out you know you can be a star in your own right you don't have to be a you know Mo Salah or Paul Pogba you can be you know successful in your own right and 
that will look different in everyone's own journey, so to speak. But I think as lo- along with the money, like I mentioned before, being put into it, I think just the respect aspect of it for me is is the the biggest thing. You know, where people are still putting their their days, their time, their effort, their energy, their lives, and sacrificing a lot to do something they love, and for people to kind of dismiss that or to kind of turn a blind eye to to that, I think I wanted to make sure that every everybody was acknowledged in that, and you know, it doesn't take a lot to show some respect. You know, not even about the money. It just doesn't take a lot in general in life in general to show another person or another organization a bit of respect in how you speak to them or treat them and I think actions speak louder than words and the certain things that I think you know it says a lot that by the fact that a lot of people that should care don't care about about what's going into the women's game but at the same time there are a lot of people that do care and I think that's kind of, you know, I'm kind of playing the devil's advocate with the, with the song in the sense of, like, it's come a long way. But don't forget the respect. You can't just throw money at it, but then we need more money. And, you know, all of the, there's a, it's very, every line has a meaning behind it. So, you know, it's, yeah, there's a lot of depth to it. So That's basically it for, for the more structural questions. We have just a few quick fire questions. But this one is about um, pre-match rituals. We want to know if there's anything big or small that you have to do um, before the game, like something that you have to do if not you feel uncomfortable. Um, I don't know. Normally I I like to like shower right before I leave to go. so I just feel like I'm ready. I'm getting my kit on and I'm going. Like, I don't know. Um, I think the biggest thing that I do is I have to put everything on the left before the right. So I could, like, my sock or my shin pad or my boots. And if I don't, then I have to take it off and start again. Um, and it is a bit weird, but I think, you know, that is something that, I have to do otherwise I just don't feel right um and then um sometimes I'll watch either clips my own clips or you know different strikers that have have you know a highlight video of like five minutes of like Thierry Henry or something just to get ideas because I'm quite visual um so I'll try and watch some something um before I go as well um but yeah, that, that's all that I can think of right now. It's been a while since you get a proper game day. So, um, yeah. Your, your pre-match ritual about putting things on the left first, there's another um, male football player who does it and who also plays a striker, and that's Harry Kane. So that's probably something that's good. Um, but um, anyways, the second one I want to ask is one of those famous interview questions that we got. Um, we changed it a bit. Um, so if you can grab coffee with anyone, dead or alive, will you take them to Tim Hortons? <laughs> Tim Hortons? Is this if I was in Canada? I suppose so, because I was told that Tim Hortons is like a big thing in Canada. So Yeah, it is, it is very big. So anybody, I have to choose one person who I would take to coffee. Yeah, yeah. I think, honestly, right now in this moment, I'd probably say Michelle Obama. Um, Because I think she's so inspiring. And um, I love listening to her talk. And I've, you know, started to read her book and listen to her podcast and She's so smart and got so many unique experiences. Yeah, so I think I'd definitely pick her right now if I had to pick somebody. I see. So that is about it from us. We have one last segment that I'd like to do with uh, our guests. It's sort of a tradition. 
where we just tell them, we just give them space to say anything they want to um, younger boys and girls, of course, who may be facing challenges while chasing their dreams, especially, of course, under the current pandemic. Um, so I just want to ask you to just take this space, whatever you want to say, um, to the younger girls and boys who want to maybe become a football player like you one day. I'd probably say just don't take, um, you know, one person or one coach's negative comment or opinion about you and hold that as true because, you know, football is a game of opinions and I think you have to, whether you're in a good spot or a bad spot, have to believe in yourself. And um, I think that you should you, you should, shouldn't have any fear um, you, and never never give up because you know if you're going through some some difficult maybe an injury or you know a bad spell where you're not scoring um, you know it, it will end eventually and I think as long as you keep going you'll c- come out the other end um, and you'll f- you'll feel better once you've come out of it but. I think, you know, our initial reaction a lot of the time is something gets harder and comfortable, you want to quit. Um, so I've, I'd definitely say that's been the biggest thing that I've learned is is finding ways to make myself better when things are going well and when things aren't. And, you know, when things aren't going well, sometimes it's harder to find those small things to make yourself better, but I think that keeps you on track. Um, and you know, keeps you moving towards your goal, even if it's only something very small. Thanks for the message, um, Jess. Now, uh, this is for our listeners. Now, the episodes come out every Thursday. Um, to all our listeners, if you have any friends who are interested in joining us uh, as our guest, please let, know, let us know through our social media accounts at She Plays Off. Uh, Jess, thank you really much for taking the time to join us on this show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And here's what else you need to know this week. Phil Naval's replacement as England Women's Manager could be announced by the FA this week or early next week. We will keep you updated through our social media accounts and we'll look at the candidates in the next episode on our Crash Course segment in focus. That's it for our show this week. If you liked the podcast, remember to rate, subscribe and share it with your friends and family. We'll be back next week. Thank you again for listening. I'm Harry Chan and this is the She Plays On Women's Football Podcast.